Okay. Okay, so, so today we'll just be going through the exercise for uh, chapter five, which is about uh, resampling uh, methods. So last week, I think we have looked at, uh, we, we have looked at the chapter. So today we'll be going through uh, the exercises. So like the first question in the, in the, in the labs, they say using the basic statistical properties of the variance as well as single variable calculus, we should derive equation uh, five, uh, equation 5.6. And, uh, and in the book, I think they said the equation, the equation was given, uh, uh, was given by this, whether mm -hmm. we have alpha is equals to uh, the variance of y minus the covariance of what the x, y, uh, we also have uh, the variance of x plus uh, the co the variance of y minus two times the covariance of uh, x y. Because if we go through, uh, if we look through the book, also I think uh, uh, where we were talking about uh, bootstrap, they I think they gave some they gave an int about this uh, so that they suppose that we wish to invest in a sum of money in two financial assets that yield returns of both X and Y respectively, where X and Y are random quantities, we will invest a fraction that is alpha money in X, and also we look at one minus alpha in Y. So we using uh, that same uh, the approach, so we can see that the variance, uh, variance of X is given, uh, is given by this, where we have A square bar X, which is a variance of X. So we also have, the variance of x y, which is equals to the variance of x plus the variance of uh, uh, plus the variance of y uh, plus two times covariance of what x y. We also have the covariance of this, which is a b covariance x y. So they now say that if we do define the variance of x as giving us var x and the variance of what y is also being defined as var y. Then we have the covariance of x y, which is cof, uh, cof, covariance, which which is equals to this. Then we have we have the variance of x plus uh, the variance of y, which is uh, given by this equation. So we also go through this where we have variance of x plus a variance of y minus two covariance of what y plus uh plus uh plus two uh two covariance of x y and also we also have covariance of x y so using so using the this uh derivative term okay the whole of this uh is now equals uh to zero then then what they did in the book they now did like they collected uh, the like terms uh together where we have this is equals uh, to this so they now make the alpha, uh, they now made uh, the alpha, uh, they now made alpha the subject of formula, where they now have variance of y minus variance of x, y, all over the variance of x plus variance of y minus two covariance of what x, y, which is uh, the equation in which uh, we are trying to derive, which is equation uh, 5.6. So, but they still went further in the book. They say we should also show that this is a minimum so that the second partial derivative of alpha is greater than or equals to zero. So we have this, okay? So we now have two times uh, into variance of X plus variance of Y minus two covariance of X, Y, which is uh, equals to this. So, so this, we can see that since the variance is positive, then this must also uh, be positive. So I think that is how far I can go for equation one. I don't know if anyone have like uh, comments or inputs before we proceed to uh, question two. No, I think that's good. Okay, thank you. Uh, for question two, for question two, Question two, they say we will now derive the probability that a given observation is part of a bootstrap sample. 
Suppose that we obtain a bootstrap sample from a set of n observation. A, the first question says that what is the probability that the first bootstrap observation is not the jet observation from the original sample? Justify your answer. So they don't say that in the solution, they said this is one minus probability that it is a jet, which is going to be one minus one all over n, uh, which is going to be one minus one all over n. Then they said, uh, what is the probability that the second bootstrap observation is not the jet observation from the original sample? They now say that since each bootstrap observation is a random sample, this probability is the same. So we still have the same one minus one all over what? N. Then the, the third question is to argue that the probability that the jet observation is not in the bootstrap sample, which is given by this. So here we have for the jet uh, observation to not be in the sample, it will have to not pick for each of n of position. So not pick for one to two to n, thus the probability is one minus one all over n raised to the power of what n. So that, uh, that which will now give us uh, the uh, final probability. So the fourth question is uh, when n is equals to five, what is the probability that the jet observation is in the bootstrap sample? So we only pick, uh, we just create a new, we assign five to an object of n, okay? So we now plug it into this uh, function. So we now see that the, the probability is just uh, 0 0.67. So when n is five, what is the probability? The jet uh, pro observation is in bootstrap sum. So that probability is 0 0.67. So the E, they say when n is equals to 100, what is the probability that the jet observation is in the bootstrap sample. So here yeah, we still do, uh, we still substitute this value for n, that when n is equals, when we assign it to 100 to value n, then we still plug it in uh, to this, our, our formula. So we still see that the probability uh, is uh, 0 0.64. So for this other question, they said when n is, when n is 10,000, what is the probability that the jet observation is in the bootstrap sample. So we have seen that here that N is 10,000. So what is that, that probability? The probability is 0 0.63 for the end observation to be in the, uh, the bootstrap sample. So with the, the, not, the next one, they say create a plot that displays for each integer value of N from one to 100,000 the probability that the jet observation is in the bootstrap sample comments on what you observe. So here we use the S apply from the base R. We have one to 100,000. We have a function of N, which we have one minus, okay? So we have this there when we generated the plots. So this uh, is the final plot in which uh, we have. So it shows that the probability rapidly approaches 0 0.63 with increasing value of uh, n. So I think uh, that is that for the, uh, that is that. So the last one is just, uh, we just look at, we will now investigate numerically the probability that the bootstrap sample of size n is equals to 100 contains the jet's observation. Yeah, j is equals to four. We repeatedly create a bootstrap sample and each sample, each time we record whether or not the fourth observation is contained in the bootstrap sample. So here we have store repeats NA to 1000. This N is just going to give us a value of uh, true and false. So we use a for loop to fit this. Uh, we run the this function using a for loop. Then we look for the mean of this store. So it shows that we have 0 0.63 sixfold. So the probability of including four when resampling number from one uh, to 100 is close, is just closer uh, to this. So I think uh, that is uh, just about uh, the bootstrap. I don't know uh, if anyone have any comments or contribution before uh, we look at. 
You said? I can uh, my, my my guess is that this problem tells us uh, intuition that uh, as as we increase our sizes of uh, of the bootstrapping and we can see that the probability of the uh, single incident not included in the in each bootstrap is uh, approaching to a constant line constant number so which in which we can uh, can draw intuition that uh, the the final result. The final accuracy of your of, of the error rate so of each of the of the number of sides of bootstrap that you want to choose, uh, it actually makes not very big difference whether you choose your bootstrap a thousand times or your bootstrap a ten thousand times. So I guess from this problem we can get some kind of intuition from that problem. Yeah, that's my learning yeah, from this problem. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate. Yeah, we have, yep. Yeah. Okay, so the question three is just about uh, cross-validation. So we we now review careful uh, cross-validation. So we have looked at the theoretical part, whereby we did a cross-validation where we are going to have different fold. One, okay, then I'll say we should explain how careful cross-validation is implemented. So first, we divide our data into approximately equal that is k subset which is like careful we need to divide our data into careful well one fold will be used in fitting the model we can use the other in making our uh, generating our prediction that is to see how well the model is performing and then we generate prediction for each of k sets training on the exclusive k sets uh combined yeah okay so then I'll say, what are the advantages and disadvantages of careful cross validation relative to the validation set approach and also the leave one uh, out cross validation? So that we, uh, from, uh, from this uh, chapter, they said, when we are using a validation set, we can only train on a small portion of the data as we must reserve the rest uh, for validation because we need to use just a small portion of the data. We feed our model on that portion, then we the rest of the data uh, is going to be used for like as validation, which is the assessment set to see how well the model is. As a result, it can overestimate the test error rate. Okay, assuming we then train using a complete data for future prediction, it is also sensitive to which observation are including in train versus test. It is, however, low cost in terms of processing time as we only have to fit one model uh, at a time. But when we are looking at uh, the leave one out approach, so let's say, for example, we have 1,000 data points just for the leave one out. Uh, we are going to fit our model on 999 data points. We use it in fitting. Then we, each of those one data point in which we are excluding from the entire data point set, we are going to use each excluded data point to make predictions. So, but one uh, one one drawback in which I got from the chapter is that one drawback is that uh, this approach can be very computational intensive because as the as the data set is very large, so I think it was it would take a longer time uh, for for we to uh, fit uh, the it will take a longer time for we to fit uh, the model, and uh, which is what they said they leave one out is also costly in terms of processing time because it will take a longer time uh, for uh, for that model to fit. Okay, so maybe I will pause. So I don't know if any. Comment before we look at uh, question four. Okay, for question four, it says, suppose that we use some statistical learning method to make a prediction for the response for a particular value of the predictor X. Carefully describe how 
we might estimate the standard deviation of our uh, of our prediction. So, so here yeah, they say we could address this with uh, bootstrapping. Our procedure will be jointly resample y and x variables and fit our model many times. For each model, we could obtain a summary of our prediction and calculate the standard deviation over bootstrap uh, samples. So like uh, for question five is just about, uh, because question one to four is about uh, like uh, theoretical. So I think this uh, this one is about the uh, applied question where we, we need to look at uh, the code. So in chapter four, in question five, it says in chapter four, we used a logistic uh, regression uh, to predict the probability of default using income and balance on the default data set. We will now estimate the test error of this logistic regression model using the validation set approach. Do not forget to set a random seed before beginning your analysis. So now they say we should feed a logistic regression model using income and balance to predict a default. So we need to load our library. We set our seed for reproducibility. So we use the GLM, which is for generalized linear model. So the response is gonna be default, then explained by income plus balance, then data is default, then family is binomial because it's a logistic uh, regression. So uh, we have fitted our model here. So now say using the validation set approach, which will estimate the test error of this model. In order to do this, you must perform the following steps. Split the sample, set into training and validation sets, fit this multiple logistic regression model, obtain the prediction, and what at the end they say we should compute this test, the validation set error, okay? So, but in this lab, I think they were using the base R approach, but there is still alternative approach uh, for tidy model, but let's go through the base, the base R approach first. So we have the training sets. We need to partition this data, split it into training sets, okay? So we fit the model, okay? Using the, uh, yeah, we use subset train for the training. Then we make a prediction. We made a prediction. We are, Here we are using if else, predict, fit, new data. Is it default or not? So that we have type response that is greater than 0.5. So yeah, what are we trying to predict? So default, so default can either be yes, when we have yes, means that that uh, person is gonna be default, so or no. So, but when we look at the confusion metrics, I think we, we, we got this from the confusion metrics where we have both predict no, yes, and also no, uh, yes. But when we look at the mean, okay? So when we look at the mean, uh, we can see that uh, we can see that the uh, validation set error is very small, which is uh, 0 0.026. But I think in this lab that is pinned in the Slack, I think they 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 were they use uh, they use an example. They did an example here where they were looking at uh, using the tidy model. So they just use uh, the initial split function from the R sample. But here they were using a different data set. So due to class imbalance, they stratify by this, they use strata on the MPG proportion that is 50% of the data set is gonna be used for training. 50% is gonna be used for assessment. So we have the auto splits. So we can see these, the data sets. Okay, so this is the data set. So we have to get the training sets and also the test sets. So this is the train set that we use and also the test sets. So the next is for us to fit the model. We have linear regression and then we set mode regression and then set engine LM. We have LM spec, so which is a linear model and then we fit MPG by horsepower. Data is auto train. But the one in which we are looking at the example is a logistic regression. I think the law, okay. The example we're looking at is logistic regression, okay. I think uh, there is no log, but 
I just wanted to show that it's also possible uh, uh, we do the same approach uh, using tidy models. So, uh, but I'm so sorry, I did not have an example. I did not look at an example uh, with a tidy model, but it's also possible uh, we rewrite all this uh, using tidy model, which is gonna make it uh, more efficient. So they now say we should repeat the process of B three times using three different splits of observation into a training set and a validation set, comments on the results obtained. So here, so this is the first split. So we have replicates because we need to repeat this uh, three times. So we can see that this uh, is the test error. Uh, this is the result we obtain. But when we dip for the second split, uh, uh, we also we also have uh, this other value. So we can see that we have this other value. So now consider the logistic probability using this. We can see from here that uh, including students does not seem to make any substantial improvement in the test error because in this other model, uh, we are having test error of this 0 0.0260 to 0 0.0258. But in this other one, we are still having 0 0.0278, 0 0.025. So including student does not seem to make any substantial improvement in the in the in the test error rate. So in that case, we just we need to what we can drop the student because including student in that model does not seem to what improve. Uh, it does not seem to make any significant improvement in the model. Okay, so I think, uh, any, I don't know if anybody have, okay, thank you very much. Uh, so question six, uh, we continue to consider the use of a logistic regression model to predict the probability of default using income and balance on the default data set. In particular, we, we will now compute estimate for the standard errors of the income and balance logistic regression coefficient in two different ways. One, using the bootstrap, and two, using the standard formula for computing the standard errors in the GLM function. Do not forget to set random seed for which is going to be for reproducibility. Then using the summary and GLM function to determine the estimated standard error for the coefficient associated with the income and balance in a multiple logistic regression model that uses both, uh, both predictors. So uh, we use this uh, GLM function. We have default explained by income plus balance. The data is default family is binomial. So we look at the summary of the fit. So, so when we look at the summary of the fit, we can see that what are we interested in? We can see the, the, the error, the test error of this model, which is like the beta standard error of them using bootstrap a uh, beta one, which is uh, this uh, value and also beta two, we, we got this value. So we can now write a function that is boot.fn that takes as input the default data that sets as well as an index of observations and that outputs the coefficient estimate for income and balance in multiple logistic regression uh, model. So uh, this, this, uh, this is just uh, the function, which is boot.fn. We have a function. Uh, that takes uh, two arguments, takes two inputs, which is X and I, then we fit uh, the model, okay? We fit the model using this, then we extract the coefficients, uh, uh, excluding, uh, excluding minus one, I think is gonna be excluding the, uh, the intercept because intercept is gonna be one. So we now use the boot function together with the boots fn function to estimate the standard error of the logistic regression coefficient for income and balance. So here we are using 
uh, the new library, which is Boots. We set our seed. We use Boots default, boot.fn. R is towards uh, 1000. Uh, and we can see that the standard error obtained by bootstrapping are similar to those by, obtained by GLM. We can see that the standard error obtained by both the boot function is similar to the one in which uh, we obtained using the GLM function uh, in our base R. So comments on this estimates, okay, we, can, we have seen that the both methods produce similar uh, results already. So I think uh, question five, in section 5.3.2 and 5.3, we saw cv.glm function, which is in the in the note, which we have, we look at last week, can be used in order to compute the leave one out CV test error estimates. Uh, alternatively, one could compute those quantities using just the GLM and predict the GLM function. And for a for loop, you will you fit a logistic regression model that predicts direction using lag one and lag two. Okay, so this is a direction which is at the response. So these are the predictors. We have data which is weekly, family is a binomial. So uh, this is the model we fit a logistic regression model that predict direction using lag one and lag two using all for the first observation. We need that is we are using all the rows in which we can find in the data, but excluding the first row. So that is what we do here, okay? Use the model from B, which is this model, to predict the direction of the first observation. You could do this by predicting that the first observation will go up by P, direction up, lag one or lag two greater than 0 0.5. Was this observer correctly classified? So we need to check if uh, the observation is correctly classified and we, we run this, then here we have type should be response to be greater than uh, 0 0.5. Okay, so here weekly we are just making index. So we, uh, we only select the first row uh, alongside with all the column drop force because uh, we do not want to drop any uh, column. So we say type should be response greater than 0 0.5. So when we run this, we see that the result we got is true, which shows that truly, yes, the observation was uh, uh, was correctly uh, classified. So we can also see that, we can also write a loop from i is equals to one to i is equals to n, where n is the number of observation in the data set that perform each of the following steps, okay? I think uh, that perform each of the following steps. So the first step is to fit a logistic regression model using all but the height observation pro to predict direction using lag one and lag two, okay? Then the second step is to compute the posterior probability of the market moving up for the height observation. The third step is to use the posterior probability for the height observation in order to predict whether or not the market moves up, then the last we have to determine whether or not the error was made in predicting the direction for the height observation. If an error was made, then indicate this is a one or otherwise indicate it is a zero. So here we have error, which is numeric number of row from the, that we have in the weekly uh, data sets. So we, here we are using a for loop where we have i in one to number of row in weekly. So this step is fitting the model, okay? So here we make prediction for weekly, which we are using the height. Then we say drop should be false, then type response greater than 0 0.5. Then this is for the error. We have if else p can either go up or down is equals to direction of uh, one. Okay, so, but in this case, I think when I was going through, I think this uh, wasn't clear uh, to 
enough to me, but when we look at the mean of the error, we are having 0 0.44, which shows that leave one out test error rate was 45% implies that prediction was marginally more correct than not. I think this, this, this uh, it, I don't know if someone can put, help me explain further because I tried going, so sorry. I tried going through it, but it wasn't clear. Yeah, I generate the budget center right now. Yeah. It's but but I, 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 but I, I if I, if I use the CVGLM functions, which is mentioned in the in the text, to yes. calculate the LOCV estimate, uh, which generates a uh, large difference without from the from this one. So I okay. don't know. Yeah, so I want to close validate these two, but they don't match. They didn't match. And in terms of my results, I, uh, uh, if you guys have problem, want, want to want to uh, check it out, uh, I can share my screen, but, but if time is limited, I, I, we, can, we can move on. We can move on. No, I think it's fine. We we are all. I can stop sharing so that you just share so that we see, we can okay, go through okay. it. Yeah. Uh, wait a second. Are you guys see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay. We are at. Uh... We just opened my did we are at question five or six? Uh, uh question question seven, yes, question seven. Oh seven, oh, sorry about it. Uh so uh the first three the Peter uh, GLM model and then uh, I I I just uh, squeeze it in, in this huge in this huge block. The first uh after like the uh, uh, use the CVL GLM model and the result result is largely different from the one that we uh, generated from the example. Let's see that. Yes. Uh, is this is this that? Uh, we, uh, let me just review it a little bit. Yes, yeah, so we just use this model, use this function and the, the data, the data, uh, the delta Data is the is the error rate of each of each cross validation, and this is is use the log LCV method to cross validate, and then the second is uh, uh is I, I construct the list at first to to store our results from the prediction uh, from the from cross validation, and then use the for loop to loop over uh, each part. Because it's uh, according to the number of rows, because it's used uh, LOCV, so the so the number of uh, cross validates is uh, equals to the number of rows, and then I I store that into the into a new table, and uh, mutate the columns. The pre the prediction is this, and the direction I change it. Uh, I I just model that into a direction, and then. Mm, I calculate the predictor, uh, the, the error rate, and then I choose the result. Can you see that? Yeah. Uh, I just need some kind of review Sorry for that. The loop. Uh, kind of get lost in my by my code. And sorry about that. I didn't write any. Is that the loop is the, uh, yeah, it's the prediction uh, error rate. And the CV is the, yeah, oh, yeah. The CV is what do I get from the GLM, CV GLM model. Uh, so we can see that there is a difference between two methods. The first one, the loop, is the one we use the for loop method to get the LOCV error rate. And the second one, the CV function. Uh, yeah. is the is the one we get from the CV, CVGLM function. So I, I I found the discrepancy between these two methods. And the loop I get, the loop I get, 
uh, the loop I get uh, is, uh, is similar to the one that you exhibit in the example. So that's my code. Okay. Yep, thank you very much. Give my screen to you. Yep. Uh, fuck. Okay, so we stop. Okay, so I think uh, it's uh, we now look at we will now perform okay cross validation on a simulated uh, data set. So first we have to generate a simulated data set as follows. We have set seed, okay, where X is we generate random number which is from zero to hundred. So why we use this term to generate uh, Y. So in this data set, what is N and what is P, write out the model used to generate the data in equation form. So here we can see this, so we set seed. So we, this is used to generate X, then this is gonna be used to generate Y. So we can see that N is uh, 100 because N P is, P is one. So the model equation is given by this. And we can see that this is a quadratic, uh, okay, where we have the response uh, minus 2x uh, squared plus x plus e, which is the error term. So I think this is the slope raised to the power of 2 minus 2 times the slope raised to the power of 2 plus also the, the value of the, the value of the Yeah, yeah, you can share the code also. You can no, you can put it in the Slack so that everyone can see it. Thanks. Then we can now create a scatter plot of both X and Y comments on what uh, you find. So here we have a plot of X and Y. So here we can see that Y is a negative quad as a negative quadratic relationship uh, with X. But uh, once thing I want to draw, look, though I know looking at the equation, okay, we can see that Y has a negative uh, quadratic relationship with X. But me looking at the plot, it seems to be saying the other way because looking at this is going from here, it went down up and also uh, down. I don't know if I am wrong or someone can put me through because me looking at it, For looking at the equation, I though I know from the equation, I can see that y, I can see that y has a negative relationship with x, but it seems uh, the graph is showing a bit positive. I don't know if. The intercept is my is minus two times x, right? Or... Yes, it? yes, yes, yes. But looking at the graph, looking Much at the graph, expert. looking at the way it's going, it's looking at something going, it went up as if it is positive, then it begin to decline. Mm -hmm. But from but from the equation, I get it that yes, that y has a negative relationship with x. But looking at the graph, it seems from here it went up, which is somehow a bit like positive, then you get to a certain point, then decline again. So it's not, C, a, it's not, a, a, it's not a, a negative relationship yes. with x. It's a negative yes. relationship with x squared. Yes, yes. And that's also holding constant x. Yes, and also the error term. Yeah. So see, they say set a random seed and then compute the leave one out CV errors that result from fitting the following four model using the leaf square. So here yeah, we have we have this first equation where we have the response beta zero plus uh, beta one x plus the error term. We have the second equation which is a bit uh, which is quadratic in nature. We have the third equation. Uh, which is cubic, 
okay? We have the fourth equation, I think, which is the other four, which is, I think, quartic with the, the error term. Note you, could, you, you may find it helpful to create a data frame function to create a single data set containing both X and Y. So here we use the boots, library boots. We set our random seat. Then we use that, which is data.frame X and Y. Here we are using S apply from base R. We have one to four function of I, CV.GLM. Then we pass in our dot. Then we have GLM for logistic uh, regression. We have Y explained by poly, X and I. Then we get our delta. One, which is going to grab uh, all our term from the model where we have, we will repeat C using another random seed. So when we do that, uh, we 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 still get uh, uh we still get uh the the same we still got the same results back because uh the results are the same because we are using leave one out cross validation. When doing this, the model is fit, leaving each one of the observation out in turn, and thus there is no stochasticity involved in the process. E, they say which of the models in C had the smallest leave one out cross validation error. Is this what you expected? Explain your answers. So they say the second model had the lowest, the uh -huh. smallest, okay. Okay, I was thinking, they said the, the, the second model had the smallest leave one out cross uh, validation. This what this what will be expected since the model to generate the data was uh, quadratic and we are measuring the test rather than training error rates to evaluate our uh, performance so 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 the last uh, the they say comments on the statistical significance of the coefficient estimate that result from fitting each of the models in C using least squares. Do these results agree with the conclusion drawn from the, on the cross validation results? So once we use this, uh, we're using the uh, for loop to fit uh, the model. So we can see that we can see that the coefficient in the first model are not highly significant, but the terms, which is beta zero, which is for the intercept and also the two slope are in uh, in the quadratic uh, model. After this, subsequent beta n terms are not significant. Therefore, this result, ag result agree with those with the word cross uh, validation. So this result agree with our earlier results uh, from the cross validation. I think uh, the last part, what they said that we will now consider the, the Boston housing data set from the I, SLR2 library. Based, they say based on the these data sets, provide an estimate for the population mean of MEDV. Call this estimate, uh, call it, I think there is, call it mu. So we have, we can have mean of Boston MEDV. So this is gonna give, give, you, give us the mean. Then B, we provide an estimate of the standard error of mu interpret this uh, result. So in, we compute the standard error of the sample mean by dividing the sample standard deviation by the square root of the number of observations. So we have the standard error, which is the square root of the length of Boston, which is the num which will give us the number of observations. We can see that this is a standard error. Now we estimate the standard error of mu using the uh, using the bootstrap. How does this compare to your answer from B? How does it compare to our answer that we got here? So we have this, we have BS, which is boot, Boston, function of, that takes two argument. We have mean, V, and we're passing uh, the 1000. Here we can see that the standard error using the bootstrap which is uh, we got 0 0.403 is very close to the to that obtained from the formula above, which is uh, 0 
0.09. So they said based on your uh, on your our bootstrap estimate from C, provide a 95% confidence interval for the mean of MEDV, compare it to the result obtained using T test. So here we have standard deviation of this. So we have mu minus two times standard error, mu plus two times uh, standard error. So we have, uh, we, we got 21.7269 and 23, uh, which were, which are the estimate we got. So when we look at the median from this, so we have 21.2. So now we now would like to estimate the standard error for this. Also, unfortunately, there is no simple formula for computing the standard error of the median. Instead, we estimate the standard error of the median using the bootstrap on uh, comments on our findings. So, so this is just using the bootstrap approach to estimate uh, the standard error, which is uh, 0 0.374. This is lower than the standard error of the mean. So the last part they said, based on this data set, provide an estimate for the 10th percentile of MEDV in Boston Census Track. Call this, we should call this uh, this. You can we can use the quantile function. So here we use the quantile function. So we can see the 10th percentile is just 12.75. Um, the last part is say use the bootstrap to estimate the standard error of the mean comments on a, on your findings. So we 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 still make use of the bootstrap uh, approach. So we get a value of uh, zero point five. This is higher than the standard error of the median. Nevertheless, uh, the standard error is quite small. Thus, we can fairly We can be fairly confident about the value of the tenth. Uh, of the 10th percentile. So, okay, so I think uh, that is that all. I think this chapter, <laughs> the, this other one is not, there are some, because I I always saw a post from uh, late in the weekend that uh, I think that was last night that it will not be presenting. So I was rushing and I don't want us to skip this session. So I think, I don't know if someone has half before we end. Are we fine? Yeah, Hello, I think we're good. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Yo, let me.